You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapters 11 with me, please. We find ourselves in the middle of Romans 11. In verses 13 through 15 this morning. Let's just back up and read from verse 1. If you would stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture together. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see and eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says that their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. That their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion be? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles in as much as I am as an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we... We come to your word this morning, Lord, and we pray that you would just bless the the reading of it. Lord, we pray that that as it is, is proclaimed and taught, Lord, we pray that it would go out and it would not come back void. Lord, we pray that you would take your word and implant it deep in our hearts, We pray that you would use it to to encourage us, to shape us, to mold us, to point us to the person, the work of Jesus Christ, so that we might truly rest in what he has done. Lord, we pray that above all things this morning, that the name of Jesus Christ would be honored and exalted in our hearts, is King. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you look at the the title of the message this week, Life from the Dead, you you might think at first that it sounds a a bit strange because we're in the the middle of, of a study about the nation of Israel and what their rejection of the Messiah means. 
that, that God's word is still true. It has not failed, even though the nation of Israel is, is by and large rejecting their Messiah. The title might sound a bit strange in that it is obviously speaking of a, a nation as dead. But yet that's exactly what Paul is doing at the end of verse 15. For if there, Israel's rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will there, again, Israel's acceptance mean but life from the dead? In short, what Paul is saying is that we should not just write the nation of Israel off. That might be oversimplifying things a little bit, but this is what he is saying. It would be easy to see the, the hostility and the arrogance of the Jewish people and focus evangelism efforts elsewhere. To say in one's heart that, now their heart is hard. They've had their chance. They haven't come to faith anyway. But Paul is making a remarkable prediction in this chapter, and that is simply that the nation of Israel will not be hard forever. They will see the gospel both presented to the Gentiles and the riches that the Gentiles experience in the gospel, and this will cause jealousy. We talked about this last week. And all of this will serve to draw the Jewish people to their Messiah and the time of rejection will be over. Now we should be clear about this, that the details of the, of the, the prediction here, we should be clear about the, the details here a little bit because we all want to be on the same page. Some people have different things in their mind when they read things like this. I've heard some people say, well, this means that there is going to be a, an unprecedented revival that is going to play, take place amongst the Jewish people. But the fact is, we're not really told that. Some people have imagined every Jew becoming a Christian just on the basis that they are Jews. They'll not even have to hear the gospel. They just automatically believe. I don't think that's what Paul is saying here at all, because I think it would fly in the face of what he's already said in the rest of the book of Romans. I think that what is meant here is that the gospel will not be meant with the level of hostility that it currently is by the Jewish people. I think that is all Paul is saying. He is saying that, yes, many more Jews will be converted, but this does not mean that people will not need to have the gospel shared with them. And I think much of Paul's point here in this chapter is to stress to the readers of the book that they should not stop any efforts to evangelize the Jewish people, and neither should we, because we do not know what the gospel will be met with the next time we share. Just because it's met with hostility this time does not mean it will be met with hostility next time. Because... We know the promise of God himself, and that is that there will be a day when the Jewish people are open to the gospel. I think this would be an inappropriate time to mention a, a current trend of ministries that exist now to, to bridge the gap between Jews and, and Christians. You see these all the time. I'm sure you're aware of, of some of these. They're good at asking for money. They do it in, in magazine articles. They do it on TV uh, on various stations, but much of what some of these so-called ministries do is try to, to soften the differences between the Jewish faith and in Christianity and suggest that, that really we're not all that different at all. Really, when it comes right down to it, we're really very much the, the same. Now, I made the, the comment last week that if, that if the gospel were not met with Jewish opposition and persecution of Christians was not involved in that, then it is quite possible that Christianity would have existed for a long time within Judaism as a sect. And we know that now as we look back that that separation was absolutely 
necessary. And make no mistake, the separation occurred because of hostility to the gospel. And that is why that separation still exists. And as long as the Jewish people continue to reject their Messiah, we should, as Paul demonstrated, plead to God for them that he would soften their hearts That we should love them enough to continue to share the gospel with them over and over. Some of these ministries suggest that through their ministries we can, there can be much needed peace between Christians and Jews by celebrating what we have in common, not the differences. But in Christians, we believe, as Christians, we believe that the entire Bible, the Old Testament scriptures are all about Jesus. They all point to Jesus. So I'm curious how much we really have in common. If one group says, okay, we believe in the Old Testament, not the New, but we're going to strip Jesus Christ from them, we would say, we're left with nothing. Pointless then. So the only thing that will unite us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So ministries that exist to evangelize Jewish people, I'm all for that. Paul went to the synagogue first. He preached the gospel there, then to the Gentiles, so that would be following his example. But there are other ministries that see the division the gospel causes and look for other ways to build peace and harmony. Those call for a a, a level of discernment. And if this were a valid option, I'm sure the first disciples would have tried it. They would have said something like, well, I see that we disagree here. Let's just focus on what we agree on. Uh, We just got to stop the hostility. We're not willing to be beat anymore for this cause. So let's let's just talk and we'll preach something that's a little more palatable to both sides. But the first disciples didn't say that. They said, if you tell us that we cannot preach Jesus and share the gospel, we will listen to God over you and gladly take a beating. We will even sing hymns about Jesus if you put us in prison. Paul here in verse 6 has really pointed out the difference between the Jewish and Christian faith, and that is that one is by works, the other is by grace, and the two cannot be mixed. He's driving a dividing line between the two, and if we try to mix them, then they no longer remain. You cannot mix works with grace on the Jewish side or you no longer have a a religion of works righteousness. Just as you cannot mix grace with works and it still be by grace. And we believe that salvation is by, to use a, a Reformation language, is by grace alone, apart from works. So all of that to say this, that in Paul's day, in our day, Israel is spiritually dead. I'm not making a leap here. That's why I want to draw the attention to the title of the message at the onset, and that is that it's the language that Paul is using in verse 15. Paul is saying, in essence, Israel is spiritually dead. Perhaps the best way to understand the text before us in Romans 11 is actually go back to the teaching of our Lord Jesus. Let's just go back to the last week of Jesus' life. Remember, he enters Jerusalem on what we've coined Palm Sunday, and from that point on, Jesus focuses his, his teaching on events that were going to, to come. I'm not, not talking about the end of the world so much, but like his death, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and even the future of the nation of Israel. In Matthew chapter 21, we see Jesus coming into the city And this is followed by the the cleansing of the temple, which angered the Jewish leaders. And in verse 17, there we read that Jesus left them. It's such a, a powerful moment in that story. Jesus comes in, he he cleanses the temple, he angers everybody, and it says he left them. All this hoopla about Jesus coming into the city, and Jesus turns around and, and leaves. The statement, he left them, is both uh, literal and figuratively. Jesus did leave. He went back out of the city. He went to to Bethany, 
where he and his disciples spent the nights of his final week. Now, this is important. Jesus has just cleaned out the temple. He's angered the religious leaders. He's left them, went out of the city, and now he, he returns. And as he's returning, he sees a, a fig tree. And he approaches it to find figs, but it was barren. So Jesus curses it, saying in verse 19, May no fruit ever come from you again. This was not just an episode of a of an irritated Jesus displaying his power and his ability to curse a a fig tree. But it is a a parable being played out where the fig tree represents Israel, who was supposed to have been fruitful, but was not, was therefore judged by its bitterness and hostility. Jesus then goes on to tell two more parables. Parables. The first is in Matthew 21, 28 through 32. If you're following along, it concerns two sons. Each son is told by the father to go and work in the vineyard. One says that he's going to go do it, but he doesn't. The other refused to go to the vineyard, but later does. And Jesus asked which son did what the father wanted. And his hearers are right. They say it was the one who actually went in the vineyard and worked, as the father asked him. So Jesus then makes this application in verses 31 and 32. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Just let that sink in for a moment. What's the point? Clearly, it's not what we say that that matters with God, but what we do. And what God requires of us to do is repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people as a whole have not done this. Notice, There in that parable, how Jesus speaks of the Gentiles. He could have just said Gentiles. Why do you think he uses the language he uses here? Prostitutes and tax collectors. He's making a point about those who are trying to earn righteousness by law keeping. His point isn't that only Gentiles or non-Jews are getting it. Right, the good ones. The self-respecting Gentiles, if there was such a thing. But he's saying that non-Jews are being saved who are involved in detestable sins. It's a really powerful parable. You're not getting it. The kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you. And it's going to be given to these people you think are dogs. But not just the people you think are dogs. The worst of them. Tax collectors. The prostitutes. They're getting it. They're believing in Jesus. They're trusting in him for their salvation. That that parable is powerful. The second one he tells is even more catastrophic This parable is in verses 32 through 44. It's about a landowner who planted a vineyard, leases it out, leases it out to to tenant farmers. He goes away on a journey. And when the harvest comes, he sends his servants to collect his share of the produce. Instead of giving it to him, the ones tending the vineyard seize the servants. They they beat one, kill another, stone a third. And the last time, the the landowner says, I'm going to send my own son, thinking that they're going to respect him. But they don't respect him. They don't receive him. They kill him too. Jesus then turns and asks a question. When the landowner, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those wicked tenants? The religious leaders, who in the story are the tenants, 
Answer by saying that he would put those wretches to a miserable death in verse 41. The meaning of the parable is clear. God is the Father. Jesus is the Son. The hearers are the the tenant farmers. And Jesus then quotes Psalm 118.22, which says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then in verses 43 and 44 says this, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And this is remarkable, isn't it? Isn't the teaching here so clear that the kingdom of God would be taken from the Jewish people and given to the Gentiles, which of course lines up perfectly with Paul's teaching in Romans 11. In Romans 11, if you remember verses 13 through 15 here, speak of Israel having rejected, Israel having been rejected. In verses 11 and 12, he made it clear of the same point by saying that Israel has fallen. The reality here is is sad. And I say that that it's it's a reality because it's true. Paul saw it, it prompted him to write these chapters. This was a tragedy of Israel's rejection of their Messiah. Just think of the the irony here for a moment. For centuries, Jews had been waiting for this Messiah. They've asked the the question over and over after leader after leader. Could this be the one that was promised? Could this be our Messiah come to, to deliver us? Could this be him? Jesus finally comes, fulfills every prophecy, fits perfect into the biblical description of the Messiah. And they turn on him. They reject him. They kill him. And as one commentator called this, he called it the greatest repudiation of their spiritual destiny that could ever be. And Paul was greatly aware of this. He was grieved for what these people lost. Their spiritual destiny was to embrace their Messiah. The whole history of their faith had been leading up to this moment and they've turned on him. By rejecting Jesus, the nation of Israel lost their true spiritual heritage. For instance, they still had feasts. They still had celebrations. And they still do, but those are meaningless without acknowledging what they stood for. Let me just give you one example. Yom Kippur the, the greatest is a great example. It's the, the Day of Atonement. This is one day the high priest performs uh, two important acts. First, he was to to sacrifice a goat and, and take some of the blood into the most holy place of the temple, sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, making atonement for the sins of the people. So that the, the blood of the innocent came between the, the holy presence of God and, and them. poured out onto the the mercy seat between the outstretched wings of the the cherubim and the broken law of God, which was contained in the ark. You see the the symbolism there? The nation had broken the law. And here here it is in the the holy presence and the the blood of the innocent is, is put there for the sins of the people. It was a picture of what we call substitutionary atonement. Atonement being made by the work of another. The, the second act involved a, a live goat. The, the priest, the high priest was to place his hands on the, the head of this goat while confessing the sins of the, the people of God and thereby transferring the sin of the people to the goat in a symbolic way. And then the goat was driven out in the wilderness to die there. And this symbolized the, the bearing of the nation's sin by another Of course, this Old Testament symbolism was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross as he made atonement for our sins. And he, like the goat, was driven out from us. 
He was taken out of the city to die. In other words, when the nation of Israel rejected Jesus, they rejected what the Day of Atonement stood for. Today, to celebrate Yom Kippur means what? That day in Israel's history pointed to Christ. The only day of atonement is the day Jesus died on the cross bearing the sins of those who would believe on him. To miss Jesus in that event is to miss everything. We we also need to understand here that it... In Paul's day, the nation of Israel was on the verge of, of not being a nation. Remember, the Romans, the Roman Empire occupied the land. And more in, in our day, we see a, a regathering of the Jewish people. And some find that greatly significant. I do too, but for another reason, in the providence of God leading to the resurrection of the Jewish people. Time will tell, but it brings our attention to the last Phrase there in row, in verse 15, life from the dead. There are a number of options as to what exactly that phrase means. I don't think it's necessarily to go, necessary to go into to all of them because I think that the meaning is, is clear enough. Now remember that, that Paul here is using some, some generalized language. He, he has to. We've said that he's been painting with a, a broad stroke, a broad brush. For instance, when we speak of Israel rejecting the Messiah, we don't mean that every single Jew has rejected Jesus. That's simply not the case. Some are being saved. Paul himself used this as a point in the text we just read a few moments ago. That God's word has not failed because he's saving some of us. He saved me and he kept 7,000 in the day of Elijah. He kept a remnant. There's still a small number. And God is still saving Jews. Just broadly, the people are so hostile to the gospel that one can say that the nation of Israel has rejected the Messiah. So the phrase life from death here should be seen in the same way. That when this time comes, the nation of Israel will not be seen as rejecting the Messiah, but open to the gospel. Right now, their rejection and hostility is seen as death. Just as one who is not converted is described as dead in their sins. So in a figurative sense here, we see a resurrection of a nation that is going to happen. I think that's Paul's point. So think about where we are in the text. The nation of Israel is dead, unconverted, lost in their sin, hostile toward God. What then is the solution? We just sit back and wait? We just sit back and watch? What is, what is the solution when a, a nation is described as is dead because they're, they're hostile toward God, they're, they're in their sin, by and large they're, they're not being converted, they're rejecting the Messiah. What's the, the solution to everyone who's dead in their sins? It's to be born again, isn't it? We need God because only God can give life. It's only God who can raise the dead, and this is exactly what he does. We should not be surprised that God says this about the nation of Israel because this is what God has done in our life. If you're a believer... If God can raise us from being dead in our sins to life and unity with Christ, then for sure that he can do this with the nation of Israel too. Doesn't this phrase in verse 15, life from death, remind you of John 11? It, it does me. We, we talked about at the onset here a little bit about Jesus last week and we talked about Bethany. Remember who lived there? Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And in John 11, Jesus had been away from Jerusalem preaching by the Jordan River. And during that time, Lazarus gets really sick and his sisters send word to Jesus, but Lazarus dies and he's been in the tomb four days before Jesus gets back to Bethany where Lazarus' sisters were. 
Jesus then talks to, to each sister privately for a, a moment, Mary and Martha. He told Martha that he was the resurrection and the life. And that he who believes in Jesus will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes will never die. That's verse 25. This was a declaration that Jesus is able to bring life from death. And notice that Jesus is speaking here both spiritually and physically. When Jesus asked where Lazarus was, and the sisters and their friends led Jesus to the tomb, and Jesus asked to have the stone removed, but Martha protested then and said, by this time there would be a a terrible stench because of how long he's been in there. But Jesus told her in verse 40 that she would see the glory of God. So they move the the stone. Jesus prays to the the Father, and then he addresses Lazarus and asks him to come out. And Lazarus does. He he comes out. The scripture tells us he he came down. He was still wrapped up. And Jesus says, you got to unbind him and let him go. A physical resurrection. Now, if this story were only about a physical resurrection from the dead, it would be amazing enough. Our bodies decay and decline. Ultimately, we die. We are in desperate need of physical resurrection. There is tremendous hope here to those who are mourning, who are losing the loss of a loved one, whose bodies are in the process of decay and and decline, that one day we will receive a a new body, that he is the, the resurrection and the life. That those who who believe in him, even though they die, will live. That is tremendous hope. That's the first part of what Jesus told Martha. But there was a second. Those who live and believe will never die, he says. This is the spiritual part in the story of Lazarus. And a part that that we shouldn't miss. And that is that spiritual resurrection is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. It is only Jesus Christ who can be bring life to one who is dead in their sin. And this is the fact. That everyone who has responded to the gospel. That everyone who has responded to the gospel message in, in faith. Has been raised from death. To life. Just as Lazarus came when Jesus called. So when you responded to the call of God in faith, you too came forth. Perhaps you're here this morning and you know that Jesus died for sinners. You know that you're a sinner. You know that your only hope is in Jesus Christ. It's as if you are dead in a tomb. And Jesus is calling your name to come to him in in faith. The challenge to you this morning, the plea is to leave death, to leave your sin, find rest and hope in Jesus Christ. If you've not answered that call, I urge you to do that today. This brings us back to the nation of Israel, and it is the the resurrection of that nation that is the, the main concern in this passage that we've been dealing with. So what we have here then is the teaching that the Jews will have a spiritual rebirth in the final days, so to speak. A resurrection is a, a nation. Again, we're not saying as some do that God would save them in the end precisely because they are Jews. That God is done dealing with the church. Now he's going to deal with, with Israel in a different way. What we're saying is that because of the salvation of the Gentiles, that God will use that to arouse jealousy on their part, that they will see the the blessings and the riches of the gospel of Jesus that they have been entitled to all along, and a great number of them will embrace the gospel. All of them? The entire physical nation? Well, we need to ask, well, is every Gentile being saved now to arouse their jealousy? No. So we shouldn't think that every Jew is going to be saved. But just 
A, a great number, but just as a great number of Gentiles were during Paul's time, so we should expect the same thing in the last days with the Jews. That's the point. Now, on a human level, this seems absolutely impossible. The Jews have, have always been hostile to the gospel, denying Jesus as the Messiah at every turn. Over the years and the centuries, it only seems that that opposition has gotten stronger. It's changed from violence to from violence and persecution to a, a theological opposition in, in many ways. But the rejection of Jesus remains, and we must not forget that throughout the centuries, the Jews have had a more and more chance to understand the Christian gospel. One could make the case that during Paul's day, they didn't really have time to get it. I think that's wrong. We talked about this a few messages ago, that they understood the gospel. That's why they were so hostile against it. Still, one could make the case, but it would be difficult to make that same case today with a straight face. They've had literally centuries to hear what the Christian perspective is, and they still reject Jesus as their Messiah. If they haven't come around yet, it's easy to believe that they never will. So from a human perspective, this looks impossible but we're talking about the God of resurrections who raises the dead every time one gets saved. The God who takes people who are entrenched in the death and sin and gives them new life. We're talking about the God who says himself that with him all things are possible. You remember that conversation in Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus said that it would be easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle and enter the kingdom of heaven? And the disciples, in a very astute question, ask him then, well, who then can be saved? I mean, if if, if he can't do this, it's easier for him to go through the eye of a needle, then nobody can be saved. And Jesus made the point, nobody can go through the eye of a needle. Nobody can be saved. But Jesus' answer is, but don't worry, with God all things are possible. So with God, it is possible that a sinner such as you and I may be saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's the same God who will one day raise a nation from the darkness of unbelief and give her life once again. Just one final application and then I'm done. And that is that there are a lot of people that we know that are hard to the gospel. Perhaps we've brought up spiritual things with them and we were shut down harshly. Perhaps we were rebuked so bad that we just determined that we're not going to bring that up again. That that person has made their choice, they just need to to deal with it, and we're done. I'm sure some of us have done that. Whether we've thought through it or not. Nobody likes to be rejected. Rejected. But I think the implication from this text is that we do not know what God is doing and our job isn't to decide who gets to hear the gospel and who doesn't. Or who gets to hear it the second time. We do not get to decide who has made their choice and who hasn't. Our job is to take every opportunity that we have to share the gospel with those around us. Our job isn't to decide who's too hard and who's not. Paul went to the synagogue every time he went to a city. By the first three or four, he probably knew what was going to happen. But he did it anyway. Sometimes he went back. What about us? In our efforts to, to share our faith with those around us. Does their rejection... Their rejection of the gospel determine how we're going to interact with them going forward? We're just going to say, okay, they've rejected the gospel, so we're going to interact with them on different terms now. They've rejected the gospel, so we're not going to, you know, we're just going to talk about farming. We're just going to talk about water cooling stuff. We're going to talk about this. We're not going to, we're not going to look for opportunities to bring up the gospel. We're not going to invite them to church anymore. They've, They've made their choice. They've done this. So we're just going to be friends like this over here, but we're not going to, we're going to disassociate them from, it's not the proper response. We don't get to decide that. 
Our job is to share the gospel, to live that gospel out in front of others, to, to, to look for and pray for and long for opportunities to share with those around us. Because we know that the God we serve, the God we worship, is in the business of raising dead people to life. And as Paul points out, he's still doing that. He does that even with hard people. And we have no idea what's going on in our world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the tremendous truth here that, that you take dead people and even will take a, a nation that is entrenched in their, their hostility and, and bitterness toward the person of Jesus Christ and you're going to remove that and they're going to see the truth. Lord, and I pray that when you do that, that we're right there to share the gospel with them, that we haven't quit. Lord, and I pray that when you remove the, the barriers to those people that we, that we know, that their eyes become open and their heart is, is sensitive to the gospel, that we're right there to share the gospel with them. That we haven't written them off. That we haven't determined to, to relate to them in another way. But we're always looking for opportunities. Lord, I pray that you do that in our lives, in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we see the loved ones and, and those around us. I pray that we see them go from, from death to life. I pray that you use us to do that. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.